gender equality um, and inclusion as well. So as we are aware, this session is being recorded um, and we hope that um, we will be able to share the, the, the lessons learned on some of our social um, media platforms. So why did we choose this thing? Um, building bridges, advancing gender and inclusion through the intersection of truth and health. Oh, so we decided to work with this thing because we realized that a healthy population is actually a productive population. Um, I would just uh, make it um, explain by everything happening, you know, globally. Um, looking at everything happening globally, it is such a topical one whereby we need to talk about, you know, the power of trade and its impact on health and vice versa, the power of health, um, a healthy population and its impact on productivity um, as well. So this was from last year. We had a very powerful event last year and we had a very wide array of audiences. So this just gives us an overview of how last year was. Um, and um, we decided that, okay, it had to be done again this year. So about the summit. So the summit major goal is to provide a platform to advance gender inclusive approaches that unnest the potential for trade to promote economic participation, reduce inequality, improve access to opportunities, as well as innovative approaches to bridge healthcare financing gaps and access to quality healthcare services. You know, this year's event would be a, hyb a hybrid one, and this is one of the, the virtual sessions, but at the summit itself, we are going to have a workshop, you know, we're going to have a um, creative art exhibition, poster presentation, panel discussion. It's going to be a very, very rich and enlightening one. And these are some of our summit tr tracks. I wouldn't overly bother you about it. And the summit track is very, is really wide. And we we'll try to cover the different spectrum, you know, of gender and inclusion within the um, summit theme. This was from last year. Last year, we had a very successful event, if I dare say so. We had about 700 participants attend physically. We had about 9,406 virtual attendants. And we had a very wide array of stakeholders, you know, critical players, um, ranging from government officials, ministers, diplomats as well, you know, who were in attendance as well. Um, this just gives us an overview of um, the summit. So we are going to have like um, a pre-summit event, which this is part of. This like this is a webinar um, to enhance and foster knowledge sharing, as well as this creative call, um, which also this is part of. Um, we are also going to the gender and inclusion summit to be a two-day event. By being a two-day event, we are going to have on day one. We are going to have a youth summit. We are going to have breakout sessions and plenary. On day two, we are going to have you know, the conversation will be taken further, having um, a plenary sessions and high plenary sessions as well, you know, to be sure that this, the discussion is uh, brought together so that actions uh, can be taken. So this just gives us an overview of, of the summit. And this was the team that participated um, last year in putting it together. So it takes a village to host a great summit. So I will just stop here um, to go ahead to introduce our uh, uh, as speakers. But before going on, as I said, um, please let us know where you're joining from. If you can just drop like your, where are you joining us from? Are you from Nigeria? Are you from Lagos? Are you from, just so we just know that we have a wide range of our audiences. Um, and you can also let us know how you are feeling today. You can use an emoji to um, just let us know how you're feeling. All right. So while we are going on dropping our thank you, um, Abu Bakr, um, while we are going on just dropping those uh, our, our feedbacks, I'm just going to go on now to introduce our audience as as speakers. We have a very we have very powerful speakers here. So I'll go ahead introducing um, Aisha Oji. Um, she has over two decades of experience in media and communication and she's worked um, across you know the, um, she's been an advocate for the creative and cultural sector in Africa she's um, um she's a creative art artist she's a strategist she's an art curator um as well as the CEO of Nine Six Media 
company and she's also the founder of the Center for Art and Creative Talent. She actually served as a special advisor to the immediate past uh, Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning on Digital Communication Strategy and she also served as a senior special assistant to the Governor of Kirby State on New Media. Um, we are really honored to have you, Aisha. Thank you so much for making time to be here. Um, I'll go on now to introduce um, Jonathan Imafido. Jonathan Imafido is an accomplished Nigerian artist based in Atlanta, USA. He's renowned okay. for a wavering commitment to nature and environmental things. And he has actually um, exhibited in over three um, 35 groups and solo exhibi a big, um, exhibition punctuated by local and international awards. So over the past eight years, he's been a very fervent advocate for artistic vision in Dakotas with exhibition and moral installation. He's um, notably, he represented the United States at a prestigious international art workshop and exhibition in Turkey, resulting in his monumental 20 foot sculpture gracing the Presidential Symphony Library in a permanent display. And he's currently doing some great work um, a 50 foot um, scrap metal sculpture to be destined for Oluyole at um, Airport Park in Ibadan. We are really honored. Um, so have you here, knowing how busy you are, um, Jonathan. And going on to Hope Azida, just as her name is, her name, her name is Hope, and she gives hope. I remember the first time I spoke with her, she left me infused with a lot of hope. So Hope is a playwright, she's a director, and the founder of Mashirika Performing Arts Media Company. And she's also the pioneer, um, she she's a pioneer user She's a pioneer in using art as a tool for peace building and is celebrated across Africa. She's the founder also of the acclaimed Ubumutu Art Festival, which provides a platform for artists around the world to, rep to present performance dealing with you know, different aspects of societal issues. And we're really honored to have you, Hope. Hope was recently honored as the laureate of the John P. McNulty Prize in 2018 and awarded a lifetime award by MAFA, and also the winner of the Continental Award in the category of Art and Culture in 2018 and 2019, honored by the CEO Global. She has so many awards, um, and she, she was recently uh, made, she's, she's, a, she's a 2023 School World Forum Fellow. So we're really honored to have you, Hope, and we know we're going to have a great time. And next we have um, um, Mr. John. So he's a very dynamic and experienced all-round multimedia full-time studio artist. And as you see, he's in his gallery, and that's where he'll be speaking to us from. He's the president of the team, the Extraordinary Art Movement, and is the current chairman of the Society of Nigerian Artists, Abuja chapter. Uh, he's done various international and local workshops, and we're so honored, really honored um, to have you here, Mr. John. We really honored to have you here. So without maybe speaking too much, we're going we're going to go to our, our next line um item. Um hope I would hand over the floor to you. Can you please speak to us on expressions, you know, through art? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kemi, and thank you everyone for accepting me in your space. I feel really privileged to talk about this, just the colors of the flyers, the energy on board is just incredible. Yeah, as you heard, my name is Hopa Zeda and I have lived in Rwanda now for 23 years and uh, I was born and raised as a refugee uh, in Uganda. I returned around 2000 and uh, in a family of 11, I'm the only artist, the rest are scientists, but yeah, there are times we are being called in our own lives to, you know, uh, take a path, uh, not knowing that it is going to have an impact. So after the Rwanda 1994 genocide, definitely the country was uh, um, was just when it needs to rise again. And uh, at that time, that's when I, I just came in as an artist and uh, coming on board to a country I call home and finding the struggles of how do we live again after what has happened and uh, just coming to terms of understanding that it was 
art played a big role in what happened in Rwanda. Uh, art was used to, to, to incite violence. And here I am coming again to use art to mend the country. And that's when I re really, it dawned on me that art is a powerful tool for transformation. Art has, has the key to open and you know kickstart difficult conversations. So I have learned like in the last 23 years that art as an expressive form brings tools on board to you know open spaces of empathy uh, and empathy in terms of just realizing that art is not just a medium for entertainment but art is transforms communities. And that's what I've been doing with our company, Mashirika Performing Arts. We've been using art as a, as a tool to transform the Rwandan uh, community. Uh, we've, we've been you know, using art as a, to tap on subjects of um, prevention of, conf of genocide, prevention of uh, domestic violence, but most importantly, as a tool to you know, encourage young people to become agents of change. Uh, I, remember, I remember when I came back to Rwanda, I found that adults were really like experts of what happened. But me engaging with young people, uh, it, I had to learn that actually young people are not experts of the past, but they're more interested in moving forward. And uh, that's when I came to face-to-face uh, -to -face with the Rwandan proverbs. I think we all know that we, are, we understand that Africa has a rich culture of, uh, of proverbs and proverbs uh, if we could just tap on our proverbs, they're just enough to lead us, as in, in, to lead us because of the wisdom that uh, they hold. So I came across this um, proverb that said, which means you cannot straighten an old tree. And when I came across this proverb, I was like, you know what? Let me not spend my time with adults who play the part in what happened in this country, but focus on young people and you know, tap on their talent, uh, tap on their talent and, and, and just you know, come to terms to, to make sure that young people have the energy, have what it takes to transform a, a, a community because, uh, um, because they're, the, they're, they're the agents of change that can define the tomorrow they want. And for me that's really, really I found that art really for me made that, that, that decision really very easy for me and uh, just as if we tap us on the Rwandan history, we realize that the masterminds of the conflict that happened in, in Rwanda, but they, the masterminds of the conflict that happened are not the ones that implemented the violence. They manipulated young people. So I was like, okay, let me now use art to bring young people on board to, you know, create and transform a, 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 to transform a community that is going to define, uh, help them define the tomorrow they want. So that has been my journey. And uh, through this journey, I've learned also to use art as, 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 as a tool for healing. So as I speak now, uh, when people ask me what kind of art do you do, I tell them I do the art of repair or the art of restoration. It's not something I learned in school. Why? Because I have learned that art is an encounter and so is life. And it's that meeting point where I meet a story on the street, in a newspaper, on TV, at home, in a market, that I have an encounter with this story. And when this story finds a place in my heart, I'm indebted to give it back the way it came to me. So I receive it as a gift um, and I'm indebted to give it back as a gift to the community I work with. So basically, it's I've been on this path of trying to find the meaning of art in my life. If it does not speak to me, you do not speak to anyone else. Uh, and it's, it's not been an, an easy path because we are encouraged to have the, the, the courage to, to face truth, however painful it may be. Because facing the truth uh, helps us, you know, marry truth with the facts. And that's the kind of art we create. And that's the kind of art I felt like spoke to me. So this is where I find art very, very interesting that it goes beyond entertainment. It's a transformative tool. And uh, this is what for me 
comes to this space of building bridges. How do you build a bridge if you don't have art? For me, I find that art is a great tool to build bridges because it goes beyond borders. Art is a universal language. Art will speak a million languages that we can never see. Art will come to us in a friendly way. Art will help me unlock something that was choking me. And we're looking at Rwanda and how we've, we've really used art to, you know, help people uh, talk about unimaginable stories, unimaginable experiences. It's only art that has created that kind of space. Uh, because the stories we deal with here, or the stories that I find that very touching and very, very interesting, uh, those stories that are also questioning, asking us, are you listening to me or are you just hearing me? So art has, has shift, made us shift to those spaces of uh, hearing and listening, being different. And that's why the, the festival that I, um, that Kemi talked about that uh, we do at the Kigali Genocide Memorial. It is again a that backdrop of Rwandan history that this festival was created. It runs in a space where there are 250,000 innocent genocide victims against the Tutsi are buried. And when I was do, starting this festival, people thought I was crazy. They're like, why would you go to a place with so many sad stories? And I, was, I told them, if we shy away from what we call shy stories, well, if we shy away from these stories, then who's gonna talk about them? Who's going to write about them? If you don't write about your own story, somebody else will come and write it in a different way. So that I come in that space. I come on that, again, it's that backdrop. Can we have the courage to start a journey of healing, to start a journey of difficult conversations, a journey that will unearth things we don't want to talk about and talk about them for purposes of um, of addressing the truth. Because growing up as a refugee, that's the challenge I faced. My own mother told me half truth, not because that she hated me, but she was protecting me from me knowing what she had gone through as a refugee. But again, here I am questioning, why was I told the half truth? So in engaging young people, we are trying to come on board as, um, can we face the truth with young people? Can we face the truth in faith that what happened can break the cycle of hate and bring the cycle of, of love of, for generations to come? Can we um, avoid the cycle of revenge for thinking of vengeance by engaging the truth with the young people, by engaging the, the young people in facing the truth. Because honestly speaking, art does not just come alive. Art comes from a place and that place is soul. And that soul knows the truth and knows what is not true. So this is where I come in as if art can be used right, it can mend broken communities. Yeah, and I think I'll just stop here because I don't have much time and I'm more interested in just listening to questions and answering questions. Yeah, so Kemi, I'll have it over this back to you just in case there are questions I'm happy to answer, then they can orient me better because I can talk for 300 years now, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Hope. Very powerful, art comes from a place, art comes from a soil. That is so powerful. Thank you so much. So if you have uh, your questions, um, you can even start dropping them and we'll collect them at the end. We would um, ask um, each speaker the questions you posed on. Um, uh, Mr. John, the, this goes to you now. In fact, he has an exhibition later this week, I think, or I think on the 8th to the 10th. And he's seated in his, um, in his gallery. He, he lives in the art. Mr. John, can you tell us you have to turn so many artwork out. How do you always find creativity? Okay, can you hear me? Clearly. Okay, uh, how do I find creativity and uh, motivation and uh, inspiration, so to say, from uh, being an artist? 
I found my inspiration, first of all, from God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. He's Man. the ultimate creator. And the Bible says in Job chapter 32, verse 8, that there is a spirit in a man. The inspiration of God Almighty gives it understanding, gives it wisdom. So first from God, the creator, again, from things happening around me, from the society, you know, I get inspired by love, by beauty, by sorrows, by politics, the one, the one, the one every Nigerian now is faced with by politics, by truth, by betrayers. I've been betrayed many times, and uh, by anxiety. I find my inspiration in those things. And you know, like we always like to say, art mirrors the society, art enlightens, art itself is an inspirator because art inspires. And so as, a, as an artist, I, I get motivated always by others too, by other artists. I always like to go to shows, I go to exhibitions, I, 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 I meet other artists, I allow them to talk to me, I see their work. So when you look at other artists' work, you actually get much more inspired too. And so everything happening around us in this country, as it was right now, inspires you. Another major way that I get inspired is through my work. Through work, I work a lot. I work a lot. There is so much in that that cannot be taught uh, just by acquiring uh, knowledge or whatever, but by practice, by practice, more practice. Inspiration comes from doing, from doing, continuing doing, everyday practice. I've been a studio artist for the past, uh, say, uh, 23 years, and I get inspired every day. I get inspired every day just by painting. The more I paint, the more I get to. Um, I think his internet. To that, uh, that's uh, basically uh, how I get uh, my inspirations. And uh, if anyone is here watching today, make sure you. Oh. I think you can, uh, oh I'm I'm sorry. Uh, can you say that again? We didn't hear what you said. It, it sounded like a very powerful statement. Can you hear me? Hello. Um you are we are losing you a bit, but we didn't hear your last oh. statement. Okay. I I I said if you if you you one shouldn't be waiting for to get inspiration always all the time as an artist all you need to do is to get yourself acquired more practice get yourself motivated by yourself just when you are motivated your inspiration will come no matter how once you are motivated motivation will flow once you are motivated other things will come in and that is all I have to say. You always just have to continue doing work. Stop waiting. Don't stop waiting. Like I said, me, I get inspired every day. So get out of your comfort zone. Start doing something. Everything you had always wanted to do, you can start doing it today. Start painting. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for anybody to uh, push you up and... Uh, uh, get motivated by others other senior artists watch them and you will be incredibly inspired you will surely be incredibly inspired i think that's how to, what i have to say regarding getting inspiration and getting inspired by uh through my artwork thank you right. yes thank you yeah. so much that's so powerful don't wait for inspiration Start doing and inspiration and motivation will come. So we are actually meant to go into our breakout session because I know that um, uh, the areas where we are most interested in may differ from photography to art, even though we are tempted because of the number to make this a general class. Um, so please, we've already created breakout rooms. Please let's go to the breakout session. Um, it will just be for about, um, because of the time and so that we can also take questions. It will be for about 20 minutes so that we can also come together 
and then ask more questions so that everyone can learn. So please just go to the breakout rooms they're interested in. Um, Aisha would, um, Oji would take the photography session and Jonathan would help us with the painting session as well. Hope, uh, Mr. John, you can just go into the classes and chip in a bit um, of some of your experiences as well. So please let's just go in um, to, our, to the breakout session for enriching our experience. Thank you. Thing that I noticed was the the men, the men that were selling um, newspapers. And I parked my car. I went nearby. There was a woman selling okba, which was like a version of um, a version of moi moi, which was like the beans cake. And there was another lady selling corn. And this in newspapers, you had another man that was selling books. So I asked the newspaper guy if they knew any women that were selling newspapers. And he said, no, this is not for women. And I asked him, I said, but why not? He said, women aren't even allowed to register. I said, why not? We're talking 15, 16 years ago. And he said to me, well, it's not their job. And I noticed even in the traffic light, whenever it was time to sell books, they would go straight to the women. When they're crossing over to talk to the women, they come with the fashion magazines. And this could be connected to the data that they've collected in their minds to say that women don't read books, women don't buy newspapers. And that really got me thinking about our own gender biases. I have a couple of um, images that I've just selected um, to showcase. So I'm just going to go to share my screen. I think I may have to be added to be able to share my screen. Hold on for a second, please. Guys, I need to be made, okay, I'm made a co-host now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yeah. we can. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, yes. um, see here, we're talking about in inclusion, gender and inclusion. And one of the things that comes to mind immediately is that when we talk about gender, especially in Nigeria, our focus is always on women. Um, but it's the same case when it comes to boys, men, the kind of gender roles that we've given to them. And inclusion also, we always think of things from the perspective of gender. Um, but as you can see in this image, you have a lady who is um, disabled. We call them um, de people of determination now. And you can see her in a kind of like a leadership role where everyone is focused on her. And in photography, there are ways that we can portray these kind of roles based on the way we put them and showcase them. Um, we go to the next one. You have Bolt who just did a women on the wheel campaign. And this campaign was focused to show that women can take charge. They can create their own jobs. They can also drive and support. And this campaign focused both on video and photography. And what that does is it gets the minds of the people, especially younger people who see these kind of images and think I can do this and I can be that person. And that is putting them in an inclusive way while also creating the opportunities for the mindsets of these young people to see these women as important. One of the major things that we do is that we look at things from the perspective of this is where I'm meant to be. And one thing that I've known and learned in my own life is that we cannot aspire to what we don't know. If your mind can't think it, you, you're not gonna go for it, right? So here we have a female drummer. There was a time back in the day when women weren't seen as they had the strength to drum. Um, so when you see images like this that portray women in a certain light, 
you, you, you're able to see them in those roles. And the more we share these kind of images, the more society starts to accept that. This is a female drama from my village. I, I, I love telling her story. Her name is Sebatu. And in their family for generations, they were in charge of drumming. And her father didn't have a boy, but she decided to take on that role. Today, she's a traditional ruler. She's a women leader. And um, you have young people who are looking up to her and joining her team, wanting to become drummers as well. And in the beginning, it was something that even the society were like, no, you can't do this. But now you have the women, the men also supporting her, going around with her, keeping her secure in, in that support. Moving forward, you see, this is um, Mrs. Ibokun Awoshika. If you're a Nigerian, you would know her within the banking space, an extremely powerful woman. Um, this is her also doing a cameo in a movie. And today in 2023, for those who watch movies, Notice that a lot of the heroines in the movies are now female. A lot of them are young female. Even when the hero in the movie is a man, we're beginning to see women supporting the man to win. And what that does is it's reducing that gender bias, the, the kind of perceptions that we have um, that blind us. Someone said in the comment section, you're blinded towards intentionally blind. And you don't even realize sometimes because it's subliminal. So these kind of stories, these kind of incorporating it in the art allows subliminal messaging where the brain now starts to change in its own light. You're catalyzing conversations, discourse on this matter. And you see, we're looking back at the history. This is from 1910. And this is one, one of the award-winning images that showcased a woman um, as you can see, fixing repairs on the roof. It was unheard of at the time. And this, this photo made it around the world. It was in almost every newspaper at the time. And that started to get women to also see themselves as people who can contribute in these different sectors. You can see how scary that image is um, at the time, but she went ahead to be a daredevil so that she could showcase her work and with an image like like this if we go to the creative way that we um showcase art the stances the body language if you see women in a room you tend to know those who don't feel like they're meant to be there the body language showcases them in a more demure calmer conservative way and what this image does, it shows power in this, in this community and it shows that the women are in charge in this tea plantation. It shows that she's ready, she's a leader. And so when we're creating our art, we have to think of how we place these people. How do we showcase them in a way that we, that are viewing it, the audience that is seeing it, sees that power and sees that um, expression to show that this is a woman that's in charge. We have Aisha Yasufu. Everybody knows how this image um, went viral at the time. And it even later on caused a lot of back and forth um, on topics that had everything to do with tribe, religion, gender, right? And this is someone who was captured in front of a crowd at a time that their lives were even at risk. But it's such a powerful image. And the person who created this shared this and it went viral. And you now see a lot of young activists not being scared to come out and share their thoughts and their voices. Then we go back to when women couldn't vote. Today, we think it's, you know, it's really nothing. I think in Nigeria, almost 60 to 70% of the votes come from women. The power of that at the end of the day is that we're seeing these kind of images when women couldn't vote and now you're seeing women being in charge of those that are being voted. But we still have a lot of work to do because women are seen to be able to vote, but they're not seen to be able to lead. So the kind of stories that we showcase, the kind of way that we document them also gets society to say, okay, why not? 
why can't these women who are already voting become leaders in society? You can see the, 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 the fight for gender inclusion. You can see the fight for um, affirmative action. But the kind of images that we as artists and photographers are putting out are also extremely important. And that's why I said subliminal messaging is a big deal. When you're looking at the kind of things that you're documenting and you're able to place them, it can be deliberate. If you're doing a studio shoot, there are ways that you can showcase the kind of images that would speak to these things. Your captioning of certain images can help to trigger the thought process. And from women coming out to vote, it was these stories, these images that got other women to join the movement to say, you know what, we're gonna stand against this and we're going to fight to be able to vote. This happened all over the world. And we still have images today. If you look at what happened in Iran um, and the women coming to fight over um, how they're being treated. If you look at gender violence and the different things that affect women, these are stories that we as photographers, we as artists can pick up to push into these things. Like I said earlier with gender roles, um, boys are not meant to be in the kitchen. That's one of the things that um, we as a society also um, help to propel. But when you see images like this, you see a young boy who's happy, who's ready to, to, to have fun and cut and do things in the kitchen. And you have showcase images of families that are doing things together in the kitchen instead of just that gender role of a woman being the one in charge of the kitchen or of the home or cleaning. The kind of stories, the way we put it out, showcase how, um, how the society also takes it. I believe it, even the advertising councils have had to conform with showcasing gender roles in a more, um, in a more equal and inclusive way. Uh, we have an example of DJ Copy. Prior to DJ Copy in Nigeria, most of the, the female DJs tended to dress in a certain way. How we portray these things, that it was very like manly. They were always wearing tomboyish type clothes because that was what they felt society would see them as a better way to accept them being in that role. But you have someone like DJ Copy who comes with her pink outfits and pink hair, you know, everything pink, showcasing the power of a woman because we're assigned to that pink color. And how you put yourself and portray yourself so when we're even creating our own art, we have to think of what the culture would be. Um, what kind of clothes are we portraying? What makes a woman a woman? How do you express these things to showcase that you can still be a woman, you can still showcase yourself as a female and do these gender assigned so-called roles um, in society. So the kind of images DJ Copy puts out is very feminine, you know, that masculine nature has been removed from who a female DJ uh, should be. I look at this, of course, we have to talk about the female mechanics and the support. These kind of images showing our leaders supporting these women also helps. If you look at traditional rulers, I remember a campaign we were supposed to do with a development firm and the campaign was about men in leadership position, traditional rulers, political rulers um, with their daughters, showing that they are sending their daughters to school. Why not you? Why are the boys being sent to the farm or to work? They can also go to school. If we showcase them with the, the, the uniforms and the leaders supporting them also to grow. The female mechanic is one story that is such a big deal, but if we look at things, even from the perspective of photography, everything is it's just a tool. It's a tool in her hand. Being a female does not stop her brain from, from being able to do this kind of work. And the kind of stories we tell using these images helps to get society to accept that a woman can also do, do these things. Um, I think those are the few images that I have.
Am I back on the screen now? Am I back on the street screen? Can someone? Yes, we can yes, see you. Back. Yes, you are back. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So, so th this is really what I want to talk about in the sense that sometimes we're so focused on just documenting that story and it's almost always one side of the story. We also have our own biases. We look at things from the perspective of how we were brought up. And that's one of the reasons it's extremely important for exposure, travel, we learn through travel, we learn by engaging, we learn by engaging the different societies people that we see. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. We can start with that. I know time is limiting. So I don't take too much of the time. Does anyone have any questions for me? Feel free to unmute your mic or raise your hand if you'd like me to call on you. So one of the reasons for this is I've realized through my own journey, and I take it back to just being a commercial photographer, started out from trying to earn with this um, skill that I had. Then it moved to these spaces that I've documented. I've always been of the opinion that when I go to a community, I document, I've always asked questions. Like I said, my background is in communications. I did a lot of investigative journalism and photojournalism. And every time I went to a society to document something, especially for the NGOs, the international NGOs, it was more from having these, say, who is meant to do this? This isn't their job. This is now coming from a charity perspective. How, how best can I also support this charity perspective to say, okay, jobs can also be created from these communities instead of just giving them handouts. And from 2008, I believe, I started doing a lot of training on photography for social change. And that was from amplifying voices, using photography, um, coming up with captions and stories and exhibitions that would have people who see any of these things use that as a way to think about their own contributions in society. For me, I've always said, if you look at my work and you just walk away without thinking, then I've not done my job. And that is what I want a lot of photographers and people in this sector to understand. When you also look at the creative and cultural sectors, when it's in connected to gender, we have to think about how we can support these things that eat end of whether it's women, young people, children, girls in society, um, people of determination. How do we help to propel their voices? How do we showcase the kind of work that we're doing? What are the kind of stories that we're looking into? I know for many newspapers, magazines, they always would rather want to sell but they also have to look at things and be deliberate. The photo editors have to look at things that from the perspective of, if I share this image, would, be, would it help to finance this person? If I help share this image, would it help to showcase this community that is in need? If I showcase and, and deliberately put people in my, my concepts, because when I talk about photography, I, won't, I don't only talk about the still, I always, add motion photography inside because we do have an art form in motion. And how do we look at these images and say, okay, I am also con connected to tech, creative and cultural sectors are now a big boom media. Are we being deliberate at what we're doing with these images? Are we being deliberate as a carry? Are we being deliberate? deliberate and thinking about the storyline and seeing the impact that these, hello Abu Bakr, um, that these um, concepts can support. And if we look at a lot of the campaigns, now it is extremely visual, whether it's marketing campaigns to get people to buy more, um, looking at health advocacy, looking at um, advocacy for almost every policy you're thinking of, a lot of visuals are being used. I'll give an example of where you as an individual who is the creative can also take charge of a situation. 
I did some work for another NGO in Niger Republic, and it was focused on um, water. And this community that I went to, it took me around six hours to get there, first by car and then by boat. And then we had to walk for like an hour to get to that community. And what that um, foundation had done was to give them water, right? Teach them about um, diseases and waterborne diseases, how they can also clean their waters. And I was meant to go document. And what the, the brief had sent was basically to find the worst case situations to show how dirty the place is, to show how this water, this is like basically the only water that this community has. And I wasn't really happy with the brief. Um, as a creative, sometimes we limit ourselves by signing up on briefs that tell us exactly what these clients want. And it's understandable. This, this is what they want or this is what they think is what should sell. But for someone who comes from communities that see the engagement, that see what these communities do for each other, sometimes we tend to just focus on the negatives. So what I did at that time was to see how impactful this training was on that community. So I spent a little bit more time finding the stories that matter. And it, I found a story of two disabled people. Unfortunately, I don't have my laptop um, here. It was stolen and it had those images on there. Unfortunately, um, the um, people that I had forwarded it to, I still haven't been able to get. Um, my name is Abu Bakr I am um, a documentary photographer and a petroleum geologist from Niger State. You Awesome. Uh, Years ago, you actually inspired my journey into um, documentary photography, and I'm glad I've been following you on on, on IG for like I um, mean the last six years since wow. when I was in the university. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. You welcome. So, what are your thoughts, you yes. as a photographer, also, since you've gone into documentary? Have you had any issues with gender? Yes, um, I think my my work is actually focused on um, on climate change, on um, displacement, and um, on women, and also also on culture. And um, in most of the stories I do, I always look at the place of women and how um, climate change is actually displacing the women, and how it's actually make them insecure. Um, I yeah. did a story. I, I did a story um, recently for Salmanda Inc. magazine, um, and I titled it um, Hope is a Small Rebellion. It's a story of, um, of a nomadic Fulani man who yes. had never had um, a male child. In fact, all the children he gave birth to are women. So um, his community encouraged, encouraged him to add more women. Uh, more, he had more wives, but then he said no. He wouldn't have more uh, more wives. Instead of doing that, he would teach his daughters how to um, tend to these cows. And um, that was what he did. And the girls are actually doing better. In fact, they are doing um, better than some um, some of these men. So I, 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 I titled the story, Hope is a Small Rebellion. Even when his community was That's... against that, he still didn't stop. Yes. So that, that's an excellent story. Um, that's an excellent story because that really just shows you. But one thing about society and one thing that I know is that we are very really think. So realize that many of them comes from necessity. I said the same about the female drama. It was only because her dad did not have boys that he started to think, why not? Right, and yes. the same happened, for example, in the story is taking the able man bodied men were taken by insurgents, they had to step up. And in the last elections, I think Borno had the highest number of women registered who were trying to vote, and that came from necessity. But so, for me, I feel there's a lot more we can do with our art, with our stories. That can help society to see these things without waiting for when it becomes a necessity. 
And I think that's where we have a huge gap. When they say building bridges, because this topic also says building bridges, how do we build this bridge between what we think and what should be or what could be? Like I said earlier, you cannot aspire to what you do not know. But once you know something and you are an artist, how do you push these things? We can use examples of using your art. When you look at, for example, Fela Kuti, um, Bob Marley, um, we're talking even Martin Luther King that the whole world talks about is because he was exceptional in his delivery and his oratory. I believe if he was someone who couldn't speak and express well, it may not have been such a powerful speech, his I'm, I had a dream. And that's a skill because that I, I had a dream is almost the same as what a lot of poets are doing today. So yes, photography on its own, I know we're talking about photography, but we look at art and the creative sector and the cultural sector and say, what changes can we as individuals by ourselves do? You telling that story, Abu Bakr, has definitely would help that community, but we can also go a little bit further to say, okay, now this community, this is what has happened. What can we as photographers using our images and our storytelling can say and do a bit of research and know the kind of, um, this is me now coming from the perspective of someone who's also worked in public service. Because what has happened is over the years, I focused on the arts. I ended up working in the government space and realizing that even for government to work, oh, our time is done. We have to also think of ways that we can create policies that will push and propel these things using the images that we have. If a story is sent over to a state um, national member and he's able to visualize it, a lot more can happen faster. Um, thank you so much, guys. I guess we'll see you on the other side. Uh, we'll catch up on the other side. Yeah, once again, uh, I want to welcome you to this session. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you yeah, hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, sir. So, we yes, hear my you. name is uh, Jonathan Imafidor, and okay. uh, I'm an artist. Uh, give me one second. Okay. It's been, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. You know, Okay, so yes, um, I think I'm ready now. So today we're going to be looking at the role of and um, yeah, uh, my is a painter for a time. I moved over to a uh, sculpture. Uh, my art started from right from when I was a child, when I was, when I was a very uh, a young boy, and I was inspired by nature. And um, I was always creating art with anything that I found around me. And so for me, kept till I found it. And thereafter, I went on to teach. And so that's that topic. But today, we're going to be the role of, you know, a, a, in the arts, gender and inclusion in the arts. And I'm gonna be an artist and have been able to incorporate some of these in my work. Uh, if you look at the idea of art, over time, art has always been a reflection of you know the society and it, it has played a very crucial role in highlighting important issues. And so artists have found a way to, to critique society and to talk about things that are bothering them and things that are affecting them as humans. And uh, this has been the norm over time. And, and it, till today, artists still do that. And today we're gonna be looking at some artists that have been uh, using leveraging on that. We'll look at the power of visual art. 
Ah, it's you say you know, central linguistic barriers. For uh, my first Odyssey in the United States in South Dakota, uh, let me go back a little bit. For the past uh, nine years, can you hear me? Yes, if you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead if you can. Um, for the past nine years, I've been. Um, for the past nine years, I've been myself and my friend the Tumpo Kola. We've been trying to to the Dakotas to present our art in the form of murals, art workshop, and uh, you know, and exhibitions. And within that time, we're able to you know let people see our culture, where we are from. And we're able to tell unique stories, important stories, things that people have, don't know about us, the stereotypes. We're able to talk about some of those issues, and uh, which is important in, uh, uh, you know, in telling people about where we're from and what we, who we are as humans, and uh, you know, uh, trying to just enlighten people. And some of my works, I will go further quickly to show you some of my works that I've used earlier on, uh, that I've created earlier on in the Dakotas. Here, there's a piece that I titled Two Cultures, One People. And, you know, talking about inclusion, I, oh, yes, I think I need to post some. Hello, please, if you are not speaking in the room, please, can you uh, mute your microphone? It's... Hello, if you are not speaking, please, can you mute your microphone, please? Uh, it's a little confusing. And so I created this piece about paintings today. So I'll reflect on paintings first, and then we can go ahead. Um, I created this piece titled Two Cultures, One People for an art exhibition in Lemon, South Dakota. And it was a very exciting experience because I was trying to draw the similarities my culture, I'm from a dual state, and I was looking at uh, the Native American culture as well. And I noticed, I did my research, and I noticed that there are so many similarities between who we are millions of miles apart. There are so many things that, that connect us. And so I wanted to draw attention to this. And so, for instance, the Benedictine chief uh, you know, has decorations for their chiefs, and uh, they, have, they always have a unique head group. And I noticed that in Native Americans as well, they use beads and grass and some of those, and bones, animal bones, just like the Bini chiefs do. And so that was what I highlighted in this, in this uh, painting. And, you know, it, it, it generated a lot of interest. And people were like, oh, so you mean far in Nigeria, people could use some of these things. And, you know, and, uh, and even in Native Americans, they use some of these Things and do the similarity. And so over time, the uh, I could be working in a competition and you know it was accepted, it won the first prize and it was printed on a billboard and this is for people to see. So, uh, and so and so and then we've been talking about you know reaching out to some of this remote part of the world where art is you know not as uh, you know uh, popular. Hello. If you can, if you can use your microphone. 
Yeah. Oh, well, well, along. Sadly, so. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, do you run run away again? Oh no. Anyway. Is Okay, yes, the Native American culture and in culture where it is in terms of Yes, we talk about an issue. We're talking about talk about this situation of pieces in so much enlightenment for people that you know do not really know much about where you know where a do state is or what kind of culture do they have there and so on and so forth. And so we're able to bring that to them and they were able to see that yes, uh there's something happening out there. So I put this up at the last minute, and so, uh, but I'm gonna take you through them one after the other. And uh, on the left, on the left, the first picture on the left, right here, uh, is a Native American, um, almost like a, a masquerade, and on the uh, and then on the left side is uh, uh, a Yoruba masquerade, and so the same kind of you know items that they use, the same. You know, there's uh, there's a Yoruba hunter and there's a American where they use and all. Of and then on the right is uh, it's a very old uh, sculpture. It was to the very of Willendo. That artists over time have tried to talk about issues. Uh, you know, that bothers them rather than just creating art for art's sake. And this piece represented fertility and it was created, you know, to, you know, to talk about fertility uh, in that era. And so, uh, yes, I was going to talk about this mural. So the Native American community, they invited me to create a mural for them. And, uh, you know, when I got there, I was a little sad because having lived in America for a while, uh, uh, it just reminded me of uh, more like a third world country because they were neglected and you know they were not there was nothing much happening there. And so I knew I needed to bring like that community. And so I I went to work. I, I I made a sketch of what I wanted to create. It was meant to be. They wanted me to capture you know, the land the way it was before. Because right now, at that moment, the government had built a very big dam and the dam had flooded their lands. And and, and by the side of the dam, that was where they had the graves of their forefathers. And and so while the dam, while the land was flooded, it washed up bones of their forefathers, their ancestors and everything. And so all the carcasses were just spread across the land. And so they were really depressed and, you know, feeling, you know, defeated and, you know, and sure. While I was in Dakota that period, at least two weeks, somebody come and take their life, and they just, you know, there, there, there was so much happening in that community. But as soon as I got there, I knew I had to do something to bring joy and life to them, you know. And so I set out to create this mural, roam freely, and in the sky you can see uh, their, their ancestors, how they were, you know, looking. Down down and we, you know things are, are moving well until the flooding came and you know the government decided to you know make one or two decisions so i needed to bring this color into that community bring this picture into it and so i created this beautiful mural on a very large stretch of wall and so um while i was creating the mural i knew that i had to include the community members some of them had never handled the paint before some of them don't seen 
a large mural like this before because it's it's in a remote part of America. And so I made sure I included them in the in the creation. And so I come join me to create it. And so I had a lot of people come around to assist me. I gave them paint and brush and we're so excited to be part of it. And, you know, when I was done with the mural, people were coming to take pictures and, you know, telling me how, how beautiful it is and how I, how I, the mural had succeeded in, you know, taking them out of, you know, the situation that they were in, like seeing the mural just gives them this joy. And, and so uh, the Native American chiefs, they invited me to a sweat lodge. It's called a sweat lodge. And they said they never extended that to anybody before. And they, they invited me to the sweat lodge. And there we, you know, we they, they celebrated and they prayed for me. And they were so thankful. And they gave me a Native American name, which I still remember. It's called, they gave me a name. They call it Tati. Into that community. All this. And I'm not focusing so much on, you know, uh, the, you know, like the gender and all that and the inclusion is, I want to highlight the importance of, you know, solving problems with your art and, you know, helping people and, you know, speaking your heart through your art. And so, uh, you know, after this, you know, things just changed for that community. Things started happening. And so this is the power of art. This is one of the power of art. And anytime I go there, I still see The mural is still fresh and bright, and, and so you know we just we just have to creating uh, you know art and telling our stories and you know talking about issues and not just creating art for art's sake. Whatever bothers us, whatever you think you can you can do to uh, you know to help the society, let's feel free to do that as artists. And so that's why this competition. Uh, yes, and so. How do you now talk about these issues? There are so many ways you can talk about the issues. Like for me, I've talked about these issues using my murals. I've done so many murals with Dakota that are like this. And then I talk about it through my paintings. And then I talk about it through, most recently through my sculptures. For instance, my, my recent sculptures, they talk about, they talk about uh, you know, climate change and the effect of climate change on the environment. And so I'll briefly talk about one of my pieces and then I'll go ahead and look at other pieces by other artists. And let's see how they talk about, you know, you know, uh, agenda and you know, inclusion in their works. Um, so like the, one of my most recent piece was uh, the one I did in Turkey in 2022, I was invited to create a piece. Um, it was meant to be a workshop. And so I created this piece out of, you know, bombs, uh, used ammunition and, you know, and discarded, I am referring to, you know, the man-made districts to create a gazelle. Gazelles are to explain, you know, to talk about, you know, oh, sorry. Okay, so I felt that was uh, that was, you know, something to uh, talk about. Let me see if I have a picture here. Yeah, so this is the picture I was talking about. So I created a gazelle using, you know, bombs and ammunition. So they took me to this, uh, to this, uh, you know, uh, government facility where they have, you know, where they have uh, uh, used bombs and war equipment. And so that was what I created this piece with. And so looking at this piece, it just tells you about the environment and the harm we've done to it and how these beautiful animals, these beautiful creatures and, you know, put in harm's way because of our activities as humans. And so uh, that would be all for my uh, about my work. And then my most recent piece that I'm creating right now, I'm currently building a 25 feet uh, tall sculpture, which would be on top of a 25 foot base, making it about 50 feet tall in all. And it's about the culture of the you know, uh, of the Yoruba people, of the old Oyo kingdom. And then when they gave me the subject, I'm like, oh, these are all men. We have to include a woman in this. And so they said, okay, go and draft out a proposal and let's see, you know, 
what what and then I looked at all the female subjects, you know, all the female heroes in the Yoruba land, and I just decided to include one. And so, and that makes that makes uh it, rather than creating a monument of all three men, now I'm gonna include a woman in it. It just makes it just it just gives a sense of uh, equality and equity. And so uh that will be all about my work. Now I'm gonna be looking at few artists that talk about gender in their work. So the concept of gender can, we can look at the concept of gender in two ways, either as, as the uh, gender in form of the creator, that is as a woman and creating it, or as a subject matter. But in this context, or a subject matter, the concept yeah, as a subject matter. And so, uh, uh, gender and inclusion as a subject matter. And so the first artist we're going to be looking at Kende Wiley. Kende Wiley is, uh, is a Nigerian artist, uh, but he is living in the United States for a while and his works are phenomenal. And so if you look at the slide in front of us, uh, the picture in front of us, you see, so he's, so there's this stereotype about Black American males and Black American females. Like the males are thugs and the females are hogs. And so He's trying to revamp that notion, and so he picks popular images of a uh, of white male and just opposes it with with a black um a black American that has been stereotyped to be tall or whatever, and so and he, he pushes you to sit in a, in a different light, and so the same thing he does for you know the females, and so you know his his work focuses more on this. You know, the, you know, we can, can. something important that I need to point out. How you create your piece as an artist, uh, you must understand the concept of material, like oil or covers, or you know, it could be anything. It has I think items that allude to what I want to talk about. For instance, I'm talking about climate change. It makes sense for me to use uh, exhaust parts from cars that emit that that, that emit uh, you know uh, smoke. It thought, you know it, it makes sense if I use chainsaws that allude to the cutting of trees, felling of trees, and depleting the environment. It makes sense to use. All these things, and so it it takes it to a different level. It gives it a different meaning, especially in this contemporary era. So we shouldn't be limited to your know, canvas or paint on wall, and so we can use we, we you know we dim fit that can uh, that can talk about our subject matter. So again, let me reemphasize. So you can you can use the conventional materials. You can use new materials. You can use anything that can talk about your your piece. And so going forward, you have to put that at the back of your mind that you can use anything. And so that's Candy that's Candy uh, Wiley's work. And uh, uh, before I before I forget, he did a portrait of uh, Obama that, that went so viral, and he did it in this same technique. And you know, Obama being a black president. You know, and uh, the stereotype that people have about black people and everything, and so him painting Obama in that context, sitting like one of the white presidents and creating this, you know, this uh, floral background, and you know, in in honor and in awe, just just you know, it just it, it was challenging you to check it out. His works are beautiful. And then uh, uh, Akunyili, Dora Akunyili, the late Dora Akunyili. So this, this is her, her work. And she talks about, her work talks about gender as well. And so basically her work um, is, it, it talks about her, her challenge living in, uh, living in Nigeria and now living in the United States as a young lady. And so that's what her work is about and all the challenges that she has gone through with that. And so she combines 
Sometimes she combines colors, uh, white colors with uh, collage, but most, most, of, most importantly, she uses collage. Pictures of her experiences in Nigeria, pictures of her family, she puts them together in form of collage and talks about this, uh, these issues with her work. And so, um, and she's, she's a very successful artist in the United States of America. And so, yes, uh, these are these are pieces, you know, talking about, you know, the struggle between the United States and how she's trying to integrate it to the society as a black, young black lady. And so, yeah, so yes. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take it. Um, but so far, I think this is where we end, we end it for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Jonathan, for that wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Bashiru's hand is up. We don't know if he wants to ask a question. He or she wants to ask a question. Sorry, I accidentally raised my hand. So I don't have any question to ask. Thank you very much. Can we have Esther? Huh? Hi, okay. So um my question is around um impact. Right. And just to know if you've ever worked on projects where so you gave us an example of the mural. Right. And how you got feedback from from the chiefs and how even just the people in the community. Right. And how he was able to achieve the results you wanted um, in certain situations where, you, you know, we might not exactly have like direct contact with the with the audience. You know, how do we get like our paintings to to um you know sort of evoke or give the type of results we want so for instance if we want like say policy makers to um make certain decisions around like certain policies maybe in like public health um you know for the country how do we get to that point from like the paintings that we create how do we put our paintings in those conversations or that's i don't know if you understand my question yes i think i do uh... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? If you can yeah. hear me, I'll, yeah, if you can hear me, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, well, so <clears throat> now as an artist, I I give you an example about you know my art for question. With my art, how best can I reach out to, you know, how best can I talk about things that really matter and you know and try to effect a change? And I realized that going into public art was one of the best ways that I can, you know, I can I can I can go. That was one of the best angles that I can I can focus on. And so that's why my art is basically focused on public art and art in public places. And so with that, you be able to have a lot of people, you know see your work and understand that you have you you know uh the attention to it and so now if you want your work so there are different intentions so artists they create their works and they just they just, they just want to be at the, at the gallery and being in the gallery there are visitors that come through there are people that come through to look at it and you know the some some works might be in the gallery for years nobody comes to to look at it but if you want your work to be out there i think you should be looking at you know pushing further than just putting it in the gallery creating works that will just stay in the confines of the wall i think you should be looking more into public art where people can you can pass your message across and people can see that you know people can understand and look at your work and, and get a meaning just like the work that i did that, that was in a billboard in florida people can see it and say oh this is what this person is talking about and so and then you can you can do a lot of publicity with your work and you know you can go to tv stations media houses and everything but honestly i'll tell you 
one of the smoothest the smoothest ways is to you know go public public art or art in public places that's one of the smoothest ways to go i hope i was able to answer that yes yes thank you you're welcome hello yes go ahead uh my question is uh you see some of these tools that you are using you are this, sometimes you may find yourself in a places that you can use and you know softwares on mobile phones and uh, on pc that can you can use to design some things some apps like that so but i think if you can use your hands to draw things uh, that will be more easier. I it is you can use your imagination to draw a lot of cool stuff like that. Instead of using pieces where you will have templates and all that thing that will slow your brain down. But here like in places where I am, we, we cannot find those tools that where you can draw, you can do your artist stuff here in Northwest. And I'm really interested in drawing and all this art, but I couldn't find things like that. I couldn't find mm. yes. here. So I'll quickly I'll quickly answer that before we leave the session. So art does not require that you use a specific medium. You can use anything you find. There was a time in Dakota that I didn't have Canva. There was no Canva because it's in a remote place. The few paper that I had, and I had coffee. I was coffee. I'll make I'll make my coffee in the morning and then use it to draw, I use a piece of stick. I would get a stick and just make some portrait with it. Just coffee. You can use saw, you can use charcoal, you can use drawing, you can express anything you can do to express yourself. You can make leaves from vegetables. And it's art. And it's it can even be permanent. You can do it in a way that it's going to be permanent. You can find some of these things in nature. So never be constrained by your immediate environment. You can create anything. Whatever. I know artists that use cow dog. I think we'll just wait for everyone to join me. I am, um, this has been so powerful, even though I couldn't personally listen to every part because I had to hear to ensure that people were directed in. Um, we want to thank you so much, Aisha. We want to thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. So it was so powerful, so powerful, so, so powerful. And I'm sure that every participant will go out and tell everyone how much they missed you know, it was so powerful. So um, I know we are meant to move to the next um, item on our agenda, but I think we will give maybe two people the opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, please um, let us raise your hand, oh, Mr. Ben, raise your hand so, uh, so that you have the opportunity for your questions to be answered. Okay. Wow. That means that everybody's okay. All right. Please go ahead. <laughs> Aisha, please go ahead. Yes. Your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say I didn't get to say hello to Hope and uh, Mr. Ade John. Uh, Mr. John actually helped me just recently to purchase some paintings. And they were actually, what happened was the painting was a female and I mean a male. And then I requested for a female version and a kid's version, and he was able to support on that. So I just want to say thank you to Mr. John and Hope. I love the work that you're doing, excellent work. Uh, thank you so much for continuing to support our community, both of you and everybody else. Obviously, for us to see the um, NESG join and the Policy Center join to see that this sector is beginning to grow and understand the value that we can bring. I think if we look at things from the perspective of not just only inclusion, but even skill acquisition and job creation, it's so important for us to think of those things because we can actually create something from nothing within the creative space. And if we're able to have the something from nothing also propel change when it comes to policy, when it comes to how society sees things, when it comes to just bringing people into the room, I think it's such a powerful thing. And that's one of the reasons I'm a strong advocate for the creative and cultural sector. 
it is such a low hanging fruit. And to see PIC and NESG come on board is very, 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 you know, inspiring for us to keep going, to keep pushing, to see that the, the work we've put in in the last 20 years is not going to waste, you know. And I'm seeing young people coming through to say, this is what I want to do. We have parents who are coming through to say, we want to train. But almost everyone is just focused on the skills. You can have these skills, but inculcate research, inculcate data when you're creating your work. Inculcate the changes that you would want to see in your community, in your spaces. And let's just start with our own. We don't even have to think about the rest of the world. How do we also change the perspective of the rest of the world towards us? These are all the things that we need to think about when we're building these bridges that interconnect. Let's not forget intellectual property. How are we utilizing ourselves to ensure that whether it's women or young people are actually earning from what they have created within this sector? The topic is so huge. So I just want yeah. to say thank you to NESG and thank you to PIC for being a part of this revolution. The world is beginning to catch up and thank yeah. you for joining us. Thank you very thank, much. Thank, thank you, you so much. And we're really grateful. Other speakers will still give you an opportunity to give your final word. But before we get there, can you just let us know, can you just drop in the comments or if we can give to people who are bold enough to let us know what they learned? um what did you learn what was the wow uh, uh like me i learned a lot even though i wasn't everything can you just drop comments on what you learned and we'll give two people the opportunity to share what they learned or what they have learned so far yeah so i i have learned but it, I'll start with myself. I'm sure we're still waiting for more people maybe to gather the courage to speak. I've learned from one of the things you said now, the importance of doing research when doing anything creative. So it, it takes some effort and some deliberateness. I've learned that. Um, who wants to speak before we go to the final session? Yes, yeah, so Bashiru says we've learned you can use anything around you to create. Uh, okay. So we can just drop a comment. Um, so Haya Tadun says, inculcate research and data into your work. Okay. Someone says, so much in the aspect of just doing before thinking. All right. Okay, okay, ah, Bashru, you want to speak? All right, please unmute your mic just for like 30 seconds so we can end. You've not unmute, please unmute your mic. Okay. What I learned is, can you hear me now? Clearly. Yes, I say I learned that. Uh, I can use the nature around me to create an art. So I, there's no need for me to use maybe templates on graphic design. I can use stuff around me. I don't need tools. I don't, don't need to buy tools. I can use green. I can, use, I can use grass. I can use many things around me to create an art. I just need to use my imagination. Something mm. like that. Right. Yes. Hello. Okay. Use, use your imagination. We'll give one more person the opportunity to speak. Okay. Thank um, you. Okay, Titi. Please unmute your mic. Okay. Hi, Kemi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So I joined quite late and I could actually relate when you said that people who didn't join would have missed a lot because, you know, even the little I was able to catch, I was just amazed about the fact that you can actually use art to influence policies. I think that's very deep. I mean, how, because one of the things I always look out for is how we can connect these things to our realities. Because sometimes when we're having meetings like this, our policymakers are not you know, always necessarily there. But it's just so, I mean, amazing for me to see how we can actually connect policymaking using art. I mean, that's so incredible. And also the fact that now I'm going to be looking at art in a more critical way. I mean, I heard the story of, um, I don't remember his name when he was talking about the man who had all girls. 
And I mean, it's also important that most of these things come out of necessity. Like when you're talking about gender and inclusion aspect, the man who had all girls and had to make use of them in, you know, in a different way from what society would have expected. So because he didn't have male children, he didn't give up on them and say, oh, I have to go and take another wife and then so that he can, she can give me male children. So it's just important to see how we can use art to change the narrative. I, I really learned a lot. That's just my summary. Thank you. All right. Powerful, very powerful contributions. But before we even go on, um, hope um, can you give us like your final last words, final encouragement? As uh, thanks, thanks everyone. I, I mean, I wish I, this could go on. Aisha, thanks so much for sharing, and everyone else on board. Uh, Aisha mentioned something about being intentional. And I think that's why we need to be really in that space, being intentional. To be intentional, do we know the gaps we are trying to bridge if we are going to become, you know, create, to, to create works that transform communities? What are the gaps we are addressing with our art? Because art bridges gaps. Um, and for me, I, that was really powerful. And I think we need, we need to tap on this. Uh, which art am I doing? What, what gap am I bridging here? What kind of... Um, spaces that really need this kind of conversation, but also being very, very careful in it, trying to, you know, create an identity of the work we create, because everything is getting lost right now in the world because of the technology, because of all the social media things going on. But we need to stick to, to create a balance with humanity and make sure that at least the art I'm doing today will help a human being tomorrow is part of me as a human being. At the same time, also that can help us address the question, what's your story? What's your story behind your art? What is the story you're trying to, what is your story? Because at the end of the day, I've come to learn that your story can be my story and our story is our story. But mm -hmm. yeah, because you're tapping on life and we, we, we've, um, we've already talked about art mirroring life. We are talking, tapping on art that is, you know, tapping on life and we are all a shared humanity. Then we, we as artists, we as creatives, we really need to be very intentional and bridge those gaps that we think are making our human race uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that's how I can stop. Yeah, Being intentional you. and just creating an identity for the works we create. Otherwise, oh. things can just run around in pieces. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, powerful. Tell your story with your art and being intentional. Thank you so much, Hope. I'm always inspired every time I hear you. Um, Mr. John, uh, if you can also just give us your final last word, please. Okay. I like. I, I just like to say that uh, by all means, if you are an artist, keep painting, keep working, keep doing arts because we need it in our society these days. Art, art actually educates. Art educates, art enlightens, art inspires, art heals, art documents. Art is life, so to say. So by all means, as an artist, as a creative person, make sure you keep doing what you are doing. Don't wait for anybody to get inspired by. Make sure you inspire yourself. That's my last take. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. So yes, so you carry, you, Mr. Dina told us, we carry our own inspiration. All right. Um, yes. <laughs> very as an artist, art itself is inspired. So you are an inspirator yourself as an artist. Mm. That's my idea. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very powerful. Yeah, right. Jonathan, thank you. Powerful session. Can you just give us your final last word as well? I, oh. I, Oh, is it Jonathan, right? Yes, please. Okay, yes. Well, uh, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's a privilege and I'm honored. Uh, I want to just give some final words. And I would say, uh, as we create our art, we should try to own what we, uh, what we are creating. And that means we should uh, research, do a lot of research on the topics that you're working on, on whatever you're going to be working on, because uh, you you need to own what you're doing. You need to be able to uh, uh, tell 
telling us as it is from your heart with research, with good research. And because the world out there, they are waiting, they want to hear you, they want to see what you're doing. And so if you are creating a certain uh, uh, a series of work, you should do your research. I can tell you that when I started working on uh, climate change, I made sure whatever I was going, I was always playing in my car, I had it in my phone, I was always thinking what things about climate change. Well, so that when you ask me questions, oh, why did you use this element? Why is this, why is this like this? I'm able to tell you with confidence. And so while we create our piece, we should back it up with research and with uh, serious uh, you know, intention. You know, and uh, I will end I will end with that. And and uh, finally, uh, let me let me let me say, like I said earlier on, you don't have to have so you don't have to have uh, all the materials. You don't have to have, have all the materials that you that, that every other person uses. You can work with anything you find in front of you. And uh, with that and with, with intentionality, you should be able to create some things, uh, in, uh, interesting narratives, and own what you create. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been very powerful. Art and climate change. You see that there is no limit to the world of art. Thank you so much. Whoa. Okay, so, so those of us who may not know, we actually have a creative, um, a, a, a creative call whereby artists can um, submit their photography and art exhibition um, and, and painting, you know. So, but what I would just do is just about two more minutes to just show you how to go about it. Would have made this a slight presentation, but we thought that it was better to have it so that you can just go on the website. I'm dropping, just in case you are you are not aware, you can go on to um, policyinnovationcenter.gs2023 slash creative art. So I'm just going to go on sharing my screen now, just so in case you want to um, make a submission to guide us on how we can go about it. So once you get to the website, you will just see the creative call brief. Um, you still have enough time. We have to September 22, September 22, um, September 22 to um, make your submission. And this, you have the introduction that just gives you and um, tells you about um, the creative call. The theme for this creative call is building bridges for gender and inclusion. A lot has been said here already. And um, there are only two categories. We have painting and the painting really has to evoke emotion, tell your story, convey your message, and inspire dialogue. You know, um, the theme again is building bridges for gender and inclusion. And we have an entry for photography as well. So in terms of the application guideline, it has to be original. It has to be your work. Um, we will find out if it's not your work. So make sure it's your work. The call is open to applicants between the age of 15 to 35 years. Um, and we have made it, um, so painting and art um, can be submitted. And of course, whatever you're submitting must depict gender and inclusion. But from what you've heard now, the wide array or, or spectrum through which you can tell this story. Um, what we, we've done is, of course, it has to be original. It has to be original. There's going to be an award which we would um, let you in on before the gender and inclusion summit, but I can promise you that it's going to be worth it. We are going to have judges um, who will look at your work and um, who are also experts within the field, who would also um, help to choose and decide which entry is great. So some of the um, benefits is that the gender and inclusion summit, we're going to have a very wide array of stakeholders and you're going to get the opportunity to showcase your work um, there and there's an opportunity that it might be auctioned as well at the Gender and Inclusion Summit. So please note this date, um, September 22. Um, just make sure that um, by September 22, we want to see at least an intention that you want to submit your work. Then submission deadline, because we also know that it takes time, October 23, and also we'll give you a feedback by November 10, 2023. So we've made it the whole process really is to just go on the website um, to make your submission. And if you have any question, please send us an email to gs23 at nesgroup.org. We'll place the email address on the chat box. So that'll be all for me. 
Um, our executive director, Dr. Sasui, um, I, I don't know, Ma, if you could just give us the closing remark just um, before we close this. Okay, and if you have any questions, okay. So fortunately, she's presently, okay, she's already, our mic is on. Oh, unfortunately, we can't hear her. Okay. Okay. Um, without so we don't spend a lot of time. We want to thank our speakers. Thank you so much. Without you, this would not have been possible. Thank you for bringing your wealth of knowledge. Thank you for bringing your creativity, your art, and taking time out of your very busy schedule to do this. We are so grateful. And to our amazing participants, thank you for staying through. Amazing. Um, we're really grateful and we're hoping to receive your applications. Please do have a nice day. Thank you.